Welcome to season two of the Project Hope podcast. I'm your host, Jennifer. As many of you know, I am a cult survivor myself. For anyone interested, you can hear the story of how I got in and how I got out in season one, episodes one and two. The beginning of this year, 2023, actually marks my 11 years of being out, and I am so super grateful for the ways my life has unfolded since. I now work with survivors of coercive control, and I'm going to take a moment here to define this term as one of my heart's desires is to help society at large better understand coercive control in cases that are not just culty, but across the globe I view coercive control as a social issue. It's at the heart of cases where women and girls are murdered. We find coercive control in one-to-one relationships that are intimate, in gangs, sex trafficking, and cults of all types. I have a master's in the psychology of coercive control, and I'm just beginning a new element of my career as an expert witness for legal cases that involve coercive control. As a certified trauma professional, I work with survivors. I'm especially excited to be offering a group survivor program for cult and religious abuse recovery. So this is not a support group, but rather a healing program. It's based on my certification in the incredible work of Dr. Jilly Jenkinson, who gathered decades of research on survivors to create a body of work that I would consider to be the most comprehensive and flexible approach I've come across in this field. We will meet every other week for six months, and registration will open in February of 2023 for those interested. Lastly, I am also a research associate at Salford University and explore topics related to coercive control. So let's jump back into a basic understanding of coercive control before I introduce the next episode. Coercive control is a strategic pattern of behavior designed to exploit, control, create dependency, and dominate. The victim's everyday existence is micromanaged and their space for action, as well as potential as a human being, is limited and controlled by the abuser. Initially, the victim may be drawn into the relationship with love bombing and charm. Then gaslighting, isolation, economic control, and financial abuse can take place alongside rules and regulations that are gradually introduced over time and change at the whim of the abuser. The victim knows there are consequences if rules are broken and they apply to the victim rather than the perpetrator, creating a double standard. Over time, coercively controlling behavior erodes the victim's sense of self, their confidence, self-esteem, agency, and autonomy. The abuser creates an unreal world of contradiction, confusion, and fear. It may be helpful to know that 51% of victims do not even know that they are being abused, manipulated, and controlled. Coercive control correlates significantly to serious harm, and in many cases, in intimate partner violence, it precedes homicide. These can be difficult topics to grapple with, so I truly hope that this podcast helps to protect you and those you love with helpful voices and information. If you appreciate the podcast, Please let us know by subscribing and comment with kindness. And always think critically, trust your intuition, and be free. We have a real treat for you all with this episode of the Project Hope Podcast as we host some of the most respected cult experts in the field today. 
Lorna and Bill Goldberg have been working in the field of helping both those who have left cults as well as their family members. So in this episode, we have the gift of capturing the insights and anecdotes of two individuals who have been in this field for almost 50 years. My hope for the families, the spouses, siblings, and loved ones who are suffering due to someone they care about's involvement in a cult. My hope is that this particular episode is truly informative for you. You will understand what Bill and Lorna are considering when working with families, how they support families through education and consensus building. In my opinion, there's a tidbit for everyone in this episode. It's also a real treat to hear about how Lorna and Bill got into this field, and I thank them for sharing some more personal details around their story. So before we begin, I want to introduce you to some of the accomplishments and backgrounds of Bill and Lorna Goldberg. Lorna Goldberg has been a board member and past president of the International Cultic Studies Association, and is a clinical social worker and psychoanalyst in private practice. She is also the director of the Institute for Psychoanalytic Studies. In 1976, she and her husband, Bill Goldberg, began facilitating a support group for former cult members that continues to meet monthly in their home in Englewood, New Jersey. In 1999, they received the Leo J. Ryan Award from the Leo J. Ryan Foundation. And in 2009, Lorna received the Margaret T. Singer Award from the International Cultic Studies Association. She also joined ICSA's board of directors in November of 2003, and along with Roseanne Henry, she co-chaired ICSA's mental health committee until her term as president of ICSA from 2008 to 2012. Lorna has published numerous articles about her therapeutic work with former cult members in professional journals. So in the show notes to this episode, you will find a link to articles that Lorna and Bill have written, amidst which you will find journal publications, articles, and a few chapters from books they have participated in, amidst which is one of the foremost books for clinicians containing useful research and treatment experience with cult recovery. This was published by ICSA in 2017 and is called Cult Recovery, a clinician's guide to working with former members and their families, a publication that Lorna and Bill co-edited. Bill is a clinical social worker and psychoanalyst in private practice as well. He is also an adjunct professor for the Social Work and Social Sciences Departments of Dominican University, where he teaches courses in social work methods, social problems, ethnicity, and the sociology of religion. Bill has testified before the New York State Assembly Committee on Child Care, the New York State Social Service Committee, the New Jersey State Assembly Judiciary Committee, and the Connecticut State Judiciary Committee. He has served as an expert witness in several cult-related cases. So I welcome you all to enjoy this time with Lorna and Bill as much as I did. Welcome to the Project Hope podcast, Lorna and Bill Goldberg. It is an absolute pleasure to have the two of you with us today. We're glad to be here. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you. And so I thought that we could begin by just understanding perhaps a little bit about how the two of you came into this field. And Lorna, would you mind going first? Sure. So... We got involved with this field when my younger brother got involved in what we came to learn eventually was the Unification Church. 
and he had been a college student um, at Penn. And then he went to the West Coast to read college for a special program. And he, during Christmas break, he happened to stop at the campus of Berkeley and someone, a lovely young woman came up to him and invited him to a meal at one of their places. And he never left. He was recruited. Um, And so he was out on the West Coast and he was living with them and he had dropped out of college. And my family in New Jersey became very concerned. Bill and I were very concerned. We were married. I was five years older. He was 19 at the time. I was 24 We had finished graduate school in social work, Bill and I, and um, we were all alarmed. At first, we thought that he was just in some kind of a communal situation because this was the early 70s, 1971, and there were communal places all around. And my grandmother was the most alarmed, and we kind of poo-pooed it. But after a while, uh, my brother started talking in a different kind of way and very stilted. His language was different. And he really was resistant to coming home. So um, eventually my grandmother died and um, he was refused. They were refusing to tell my father, have my father get in touch with him. So my father threatened that he was going to get the um, state troopers involved if, if they wouldn't let him have access to his son. Eventually, my brother came home. And my brother, when he was first um, going out there, he had long hair it was the time of Vietnam. He, he was an anti-war activist. He played the guitar. And when he came off the plane, he had transformed. He was wearing a suit, short hair, and he was speaking with a Korean accent. And so there was quite a transformation. And I was having a hard time making a connection to him. And we didn't know about cults. It was early on and people didn't know about these groups at that point. But in any case, eventually, because of our alarm about how he changed when he went back, we all started investigating and we eventually found out that this group that we thought was so benign was really the Unification Church. And he was involved in a cultic type group. So then my family, at that point, um, we were trying to brainstorm how, how are we going to deal with it? And we ended up speaking to another family from New Jersey, and they had had a deprogramming. And eventually... My brother came out as a result of that. But that whole process, um, you know, really brought us into this field. Bill and I were already social workers, working as social workers, and we were asked to have a a group and um, for former cult members. and, And that started in 1976, and it's still running now. I bet we can get that the label of the um, the longest support cult group around. Yeah, yeah. There, when we we wanted to do something to help, um, and uh, and because we're social workers, that was uh, the way that we felt we could help by giving support to people who had just come out of cults. Again, this was as Lauren was saying, this was before. The, the word cult was even very much used. It, it, we we didn't have a paradigm for what happened to him when he briefly came home for the the funeral of his grandmother, 
and and we saw how he was just a totally different person. It was so alarming to us. And as as Lorna said, it, it was her grandmother, her other grandmother, her this the one that died was her paternal grandmother. This the the one that we're talking about now was her maternal grandmother who who was so alarmed. And the rest of us, uh, Lorna's folks and and she and I said, he'll grow out of it. We're all civil libertarians. We uh, we just used our the um the the models that we knew from most experiences, which is that people try on an adolescent ideology and then grow out of it. But if when he came back for that very short period of time uh, and had been just so totally transformed uh, was when when we all became uh, alarmed and, and felt that we had to do something. Well, this is so interesting because, you know, as I'm kind of processing that um, this was kind of back in the day and we didn't have you know, three decades of survivor research. Right. Um, I am so curious, um, whatever you're comfortable sharing, Lorna, about kind of how without that research, without that understanding that we now have, how did he do? And what was even done? And how did you all kind of fumble through that? Well, it was fumbling through it, exactly, (laughs) Jennifer. It was, um, we found someone who um, was a deprogrammer, and as it happened, um, he escaped the first time. And then, you know, we had people from the group who were contacting us, telling us ideas about how to get my brother out. People who, who had left the group. Oh. Who had left the group. Yeah. Or the, uh, the, there were very few people at that time who really had any knowledge of what was going on in cults. Very few. And we were fortunate enough to get involved with that network. Mm-hmm. And people started talking to us and explaining their experience, how they rescued their kids. Uh, from cults. And it was eye opening to us, because they gave us a a model uh, in terms of mind control, that just the the penny dropped, just everything fit. And suddenly we understood what was going on with him. And that our um, uh, earlier plan to wait until he comes to his senses, and he'll grow out of it, and, and, and the rest of it, we we saw it just wasn't going to fit, and that's when the family mobilized and um, hired somebody uh, to try to get him out. But as Lorna said, he uh, uh, first her, her, her brother her brother uh, was able to get away. It, it, don't forget, this was before the time that we were we knew about exit counseling. We it, it was, no nobody was, will. Um, kidnap somebody or hold them against their will today and it's 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 not only illegal it's it's also it's it's not necessary but at that time that was the only thing that that people said worked so that's what we tried and because we were so upset that he had gone back to the cult is when we formed our group because we wanted to help in some way yeah and and After that, um, that was a good period of time because we started to learn and and we contacted this wonderful person, um, Jack Clark, Dr. Jack, John Clark, who eventually became the head of American Family Foundation, which was the predecessor of ICSA. And he was very helpful. We spoke with Margaret Singer and she was on the West Coast and she understood the Moonies well because 
she was located in Berkeley and she had worked in World War II, um, the Korean War with prisoners of war and American prisoners of war. And so she saw the same dynamics in play with the cult, the Moonies and the American prisoners of war and explained that to us. And we read uh, Robert Lifton had done some work in that area too. So we started to have a better picture of what we were dealing with. And as it happened, someone who had been in the, in the cult with my brother who had left um, got in touch with us and eventually told us about a group of people who were attorneys that were getting people out of the cult um, illegally. Um, wow. through, through conservatorship. Conservatorship oh, uh, was a, it's a mechanism used if you have a little old lady with a thousand cats who um, is being pre uh, preyed upon by, by others. And there was a short period of time in California when sympathetic judges were um, using that mechanism to grant families a period of time where they could talk to their grown children um, and, and try to help them to recognize how they had been manipulated after which they would have to appear, be, the, the, the court would uh, oversee what, what kind of intervention was made. Um, and after a, a, a period of time, the uh, young adult would come before the court and say, either I want to go back or I want to stay out or, or whatever. Um, it, that, that, it was a very short window and, and, uh, the, California eventually decided that this was a misuse of the uh, uh, of that um, concept, uh, but we we were able to use it to help have Lorna's brother um, talk to somebody, um, and and because it was a legal mechanism, he gr he agreed to speak to somebody, and it was a a, a few days. And he he said he felt the veil lift. Um, All of a sudden, he understood what was what was going on, and um, and he decided to to come out. Uh, he spent a, a few months um, calling other people that he had gotten into the cult and families of those people, and trying to get them to see what the dynamics were, what was going on. And then uh, eventually, after a few months, he moved on with his life, yeah. went back to school, got uh, finished his school, got a master's degree, started his own business. He's doing very okay. well now. Um, it's, it, it was just a, a short, a relatively short blip in his life. But because it, it was uh, the the his story was uh, so uh, compelling to us. And because we are in a helping profession, it became the theme, uh, of our private practices, uh, from then on. Amazing. And thank you also, Bill, for kind of taking it down the, the historical timeline that way, because it's always so nice to hear, you know, some people have a smoother road in recovery than others. And of course that's based on so many right. factors, but it's always nice to hear the happy success stories, you know, and yet also what I'm really appreciating also about this story is Lorna, I think you even used the term uh, terror and um, Bill, you were speaking also about you know, this was back in the day and there's a whole history around this exit counseling kind of field. And now, of course, that is unethical to kidnap people and to program them and we don't do that anymore. But, you know, I, I want to just comment. It, it may sound extreme to people, likely not the parents that are listening to this podcast, yeah. 
but this is this is the extreme feelings that are generated from these types of situations. Um, you know, I heard someone, I think actually it was in uh, my interview with Sarah and Nippy, who uh, were from the Nexium group. And Nippy made this comment that I, I can't remember if it was actually recorded or a conversation that we had, but he made some comment about, um, you know, I believe that people only kill. They only go to murder or thinking about murder when it's the only option left. And when things are that extreme, you know, it really is a reflection of just how incredibly damaging and concerning and worrisome it all is. Oh, absolutely. You know, when my brother came for my mother's, my grandmother's funeral, it was a sad time for the family to begin with. And when we, when people were making condolence calls to our house after the funeral, my brother was going around um, showing them the principles of the Unification Church. And it was so strange, you know, <laughs> he was my baby brother. I loved him so much. And to feel so disconnected to this person, it was so alarming. And my whole family just was incredibly alarmed. And that's when we started to feel what has happened here, you know, and the pain of that, to feel that disconnection. And we had been feeling that in phone calls and, you know, different when we asked him to come home and he didn't come home and, and he wasn't sounding like himself. And the person, you know, that I loved so much to feel, and I, I can only imagine what parents feel, the pain of not being able to connect with someone that you've known your whole life, and they're suddenly a different person. You know, I feel so much for these families. But as you mentioned, Jennifer, we've come a long way. And we're we're talking decades ago when when Lauren and I first got involved, and uh, the um, the step of of, of of grabbing somebody and saying, "Listen, just listen to what this person has to say." We there's there's now literature, there's research, there's there's much more sophisticated and um, reasonable attempts and ways to talk people into listening to somebody uh, on on their own, where where they agree to sit down and and it's much more efficacious when somebody agrees. Uh, it 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 was it was like a whole different time back when we first got be, got involved. It's amazing. I feel you know it's such an honor to have the two of you on the podcast and just that whole history. I mean, it really you know the two of you are really part of the originals. I would say. <laughs> so. Now, of course, the two of you are kind of in tandem, it sounds like, working with both families and supporting families, maybe even going through their journey to having a desire potentially to get their family member out, and then also kind of working with survivors. Would you mind sharing a little bit of kind of an overview of what that process might look like? Families usually contact us after they've gone through the the initial period of confusion what's going on yeah. with my uh, son or daughter or sometimes I should also say sometimes we're contacted by adults whose uh, elderly parents have gotten involved or whose siblings have gotten involved so the the, the typical case is parents with a young adult uh, son or daughter involved in a cult, but 
there are uh, other times, other, right, right. It, it, husbands and wives. Husbands and wives, yeah. And usually when they, they contact us, they say, this is what's going on. This is what I've tried. I've tried yelling at them. I tried saying, don't you realize this is a cult? Look at this literature. Listen, listen to this podcast. You're involved in something dangerous. And um, the, the loved one uh, says no. Uh, either, either they say, I won't listen to it, or they listen to it and, and re reject all of the, um, the uh, arguments that, that are there. And the family then might turn to us and to our colleagues, where we're not the only ones that, that are involved in this by any means, um, and ask for a strategy. So that's where we try to come in. We, um, one of us, on occasion, both of us, but usually it's one of us meets with the family and, and we discuss the dynamics. I ask the family first to, uh, give me a history of the individual um, as they were growing up, traumatic events, how were they um, in terms of uh, friendships with others? Were they terribly shy? Were they extroverted? Are they overachievers? Each of those uh, categories and, and 20 others that I, I didn't go into <laughs> um, requires a slightly different uh, intervention. Um, I ask if there's anyone uh, that their their family member has a particular closeness to um, that they might see as someone who has some wisdom, usually not a family member. Sometimes it's an uncle or an aunt. Sometimes it's a, a parent. Sometimes it's a sibling. Sometimes it's a coach. Sometimes it's a clergy person. Um, and and sometimes it's a friend, and I, I talk to them about whether that individual might be an ally in getting the, the, the individual involved to sit down and talk um, about, about how they got involved. I ask them about uh, losses in the past. How has your loved one dealt with losses? Um, loss of a love if, if they had a love interest that didn't work out, loss of a grandparent, loss of a pet, because how they dealt with the mourning around that loss um, often sets a pattern for how they'll deal with mourning. The, the, and the reason I, I'm, I'm saying mourning is, is because when you um, have seen that you were manipulated by a cultic group, when you recognize that um, your dreams of this idyllic uh, life and everyone loving each other and everything being perfect and having the answer to the unanswerable questions, when, when you find out that that was a, a balloon that got gets popped because it's not true because it's it's um, it's manipulative it's it's uh, it's it's only using certain uh, uh, facts and denying yourself the the big picture and being manipulated and forced along a path. There's there's a period of mourning that the individual goes through where they have to. Just like when we mourn somebody that we love, what we do is we think about that person a lot. We think about the experiences we had with them, and we look at it in a different way. Um, we 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 usually um, uh, think kindly of them, although we might think of other things that happened, and and we spend a period of time, and then in effect. In a healthy morning, what we do is we kind of wrap up those feelings and we put them in the attic, um, as we might with with, with pictures and, and the like. The, the person's still a part of our life, but we're recognizing that we've got to move on with our life with some newfound knowledge. When you're mourning a loved one, the newfound knowledge is this person is not going to be here for me now. So how do I move on? 
if they had a good, healthy morning period, sad, but then they bounced back and and moved on, then that's a, a, um, a good omen for how an exit counseling will will work. Um, the the once you have a good exit counselor, a good individual that can help the cult member recognize how they were manipulated and how they were uh, placed into a, a state of heightened suggestibility and narrowed consciousness that made them go along with things that they wouldn't normally go along with, then they have a choice. Exit counseling does not stop somebody from being a member of a cult. All it does is to put them back at uh, square one where they have a choice to make. Most people, in our experience, the great majority of people, once they've been shown how they were manipulated, choose freedom and recognize that what they gave up in order to become part of the cult was far greater than than the dream of, of that, that made them join it. There have been um, other individuals throughout the, the decades we've been working who've decided that they're going to stay in the cult. They, they say, uh, um, the, my guru might have been, not be everything that he uh, or she claims they were, but at least they're trying and I'd rather be in the group. And, and my answer to families at that time is they've made their choice. They made their choice with information. Mm-hmm. And you've done your best to help them to make a healthier choice. And you've got to move on. Bill, don't a lot of those people eventually come out when they're ready to come out? Yeah. Maybe yeah, I, not at that moment with their family intervening, but they go back and they can't forget what they've learned. We've had a lot of experiences of that. Yeah. Um, absolutely. Which, which creates hope for families. If yeah. someone does go back, they at least have that information yeah. and it's hard not to see it. Yes. The dynamics of the group. When In fact, Honestly, I can relate to that because part of my story of getting out was that my husband at the time, now ex-husband, um, that was an arranged marriage within the group, he was the one that actually kind of presented me with all the information. Then, of course, within the group mindset, I believed that now I had my own questions, but in order to be truly empowered, I needed to address that with the teachers myself. Right. So I did, got sucked back in. Right. But what happened was exactly that, that now a wool had been pulled from the right. veil that I was under. And I kept thinking the the touch point for me with that was actually, um, it was about uh, some sort of state of empowerment, right? Because I was being told if I was in this cult that I wasn't really making my own decisions or my, my own self. And so I started to speak up more and I started to kind of participate in wanting to push some of the rules and the decision-making. And I saw that that wasn't going so well, right. or the teacher would kind of align with me, say, yes, you are, you know, you are empowered in this way in the group to start changing things and making these decisions. And then literally within hours, the message would change. Right. Timing is everything. Is. Uh, And the problem is that when you have somebody in a cult, we don't know when the good time is. But everybody, in my experience, everybody that's been in a cult had tremendous doubts while they were in, that they just suppressed. They didn't allow it to come to consciousness. So when they speak to somebody, like an exit counselor, who helps them to see how they were manipulated, they know on some level that this is the case, that this is what happened. They might not be ready, as Lorna said, they might not be ready at that time to acknowledge it, but sometimes if the timing is right, and again, we don't know when the timing is is good. Um, it can be 
at a time that they are having those doubts and they can't get out of their mind what they were told. I, I spoke to a, a woman, this is, I guess, maybe 20 years ago, who um, was in a, a group uh, where the leader claimed to be a reincarnation of Jesus. And um, he, he was a particularly odious individual. Um, but the group members saw him as the Messiah. And I said to her, uh, her uh, Jesus was a humble man. Is your, uh, is your cult leader a humble man? I don't remember what her answer was. But two years later, she called me to tell me that she had left the group because she couldn't get that question out of her mind. Now, it, it was, I asked the question not because I was brilliant, believe me. I had no idea that it was going to play on her. And when, and her answer, she gave me an answer, whatever it was at the time. But what was el- ever was going on with her made her fertile ground at that time and couldn't get that out of her mind. So we always say to, to people, talk to your uh, loved one respectfully, um, acknowledge what they're looking for, question them whether... Um, this is uh, the best way to achieve what they want to achieve. Um, acknowledge that people make mistakes and w- ask them what they would do if they found that this was a mistake. Would they w- would they have the courage to leave? Um, and just plant a, a seed in their mind. I always say to people, I have nothing to suggest to you that's going to make your loved one change their mind and leave. But I will give you the questions to ask them that might eventually lead them to recognize it, it might be better for me to uh, to leave this group because it's not everything it was cracked up to be. Uh, it's really, um, you know, just thinking about the families that might be listening, I am just... I I personally am also just feeling so much hope, you know, because sometimes for me, I feel like a bit of a broken record um, when I say to the families, you're always the one that's going to have to live with the decision of whatever you do. In some ways, I'm finding comfort for the first time in embracing the unknowing about when is the right timing. What is the exact thing to say? All of that, because we can't even really guess. We can just give and remain in communication so that when that timing is right, hopefully, you know, the family or loved ones are a safe place to land. Exactly, Mm -hmm. exactly. And, and, and we, we try to help the family to uh, clear away the obstacles that would keep the person from leaving. Yeah, something, you know, that I noticed in my own family situation was that certainly it was more, uh, it wasn't as slow a process as go as typically goes on today. But it's very important that the person involved in these kinds of situations feels a lot of respect from the family, that they've been on a course that they felt was so right. They made these, they thought were decisions and they had enlightened their lives. And it's so, it's very painful and families have to appreciate how painful it is for someone who spent perhaps many, many years in one of these groups to reassess the situation yeah. and face that they made a terrible mistake and they threw their life or of course. And I hope, you know, and I think families do, and I'm sure that families that listen to your podcast do have compassion. But, you know, 
the families can feel so frustrated and angry right. at times because um, they can't make that connection and they might be treated with someone who's treated them in a very arrogant way. And nevertheless, um, the, you know, people coming out of these groups need a lot of respect. One of the things for my brother that was very important, um, he was offered a job, um, not in where my family lived, but you know, in another place, um, he had friends from Penn that he still, you know, he was able to get in touch with and they offered him a job and he could kind of reconstitute his life a bit away from the family. And that helped him with his own sense of self and self-esteem and, you know, it's very important how these issues are handled by families. Yeah. Brenda, this reminds me that um, I read the article that's on your website that we'll link to in the podcast called Lessons Learned Therapy with Former Members of Cultic Groups. As I was reading through it, it really struck me that in this field, and at least my experience thus far of counseling with survivors is, well, first of all, I have a complete aversion to any sort of power over or pushing anybody coercion, right? Because that happened to me. So that's been a very interesting thing for me to look at and kind of check in everything that I do. Um, but I would say that I probably err on a different end of the extreme of really kind of giving people space and sort of that respect that you talk about, Lorna. And just as I was reading through that article, I thought, what a special group of souls the, the survivor counselors are because they're just, it's necessary that the individual, the survivors are empowered and that they feel empowered again. You know, it reminds me of your brother that, that we're doing things that, you know, make us feel alive and accomplished and all of those things that, um, and then of course, being in a one-to-one, -one, you know, counseling type relationship, just how extraordinarily important it is that in that relationship, that that individual is given all the respect all the power to choose, to control the dynamic, to question. For me, it's so freeing. It just kind of, for me in particular, every new client that I take on in this field, I always have a conversation with them also about, I, I don't function in normal therapeutic boundaries, but we will talk about boundary crossing when and if I do, and I'll ask your permission around that because some of my personal stories might help you to understand something. Um, and that, you know, I know that's sort of outside of sort of traditional therapy, but it just, um, it makes things so real and human. And I, I so appreciate that in this field. And I think your article really kind of exuded that quality. And so um, I'm looking forward to people reading it. Oh, well, thank you, Jennifer. You know, when I, um, I was trained as a psychoanalyst, I was trained psychoanalytically and the way to do psychoanalytic work was to move in those years, you know, in the seventies was more of being a blank screen and letting the people that came to you, you know, project whatever they saw you as and, and working with them in that way. And, you know, what I soon learned is that people who come out of cult groups who've had this controlling uh, cult leader begin to fear, you know, that I'm going to be that way. And, you know, it really was not working, not 
talking to them and making myself more of a human person like you're talking about. <laughs> exactly. You know, and um, otherwise they would feel paranoid with me, uncomfortable and, you know, project all these terrible things onto me. And, and it's so important to talk about the relationship every step of the way and how people are feeling. It becomes an open-ended dialogue to talk about how they're feeling in their relationship with me, which contrasts. And I, I imagine you're doing that too, Jennifer. And that contrasts with, you know, the silent therapist yeah. that just doesn't work at all. <laughs> Or, yes, or and even the, to the, oh, sorry, Bill, go ahead. Or, or with the cult leader who claims to have all the answers. Um, mm -hmm. our, our stance as therapists is um, maybe together we can look at this right. using your strengths, Partners. using your, your uh, knowledge and your desires and help you to come up with a way to approach the situation that fits for you that where you have your dignity and and we don't we don't we as therapists don't give people answers we try to help them as i said before clear away the the obstacles clear away the cobwebs um because all of us approach situations in our lives uh based on our history it, it reality reminds us of things that um happened to us earlier in in our in our life and we tend to regress to that state in in a uh, difficult situation and uh what you try to do in therapy is to help the individual to see that the way they're responding to a situation has more to do with those early life experiences when it comes to our cult when well, I was going to say when it comes to the cult uh, of course, there's it, there's a manipulation in that they reg uh, uh, they set themselves up to help the individual to regress and become childlike, so that they're ready to believe the way a child would believe, and that's that's what they tap into. Yeah. Work with former cult members, especially in the beginning, requires a lot of psychoeducational work helping them to, to recognize um, manipulation, helping them to recognize the techniques that were used on them and, yeah. and not blaming them, not blaming them, not saying, well, if, if, uh, it, it, you know, if that happened to me, I wouldn't have gotten involved with the car. I would have said, no, I'm out of here. Uh, that's, that's not giving the person the, um, the dignity of knowing that they made a decision at that time based on the information that they had. Oh. And if they had had more information, they probably would have made a different decision. Right. And based on a whole altered universe that they were living in, you know, everything makes sense inside that little bubble. Right. Right. Exactly. Exactly. I wondered if, um, there was anything in terms of maybe common struggles or uh, issues or things that you kind of encounter typically with families that you might um, feel moved to comment on where there might be some helpful words to them. One of the things that I have personally experienced a tiny bit of um, when it is a parent to parents that are trying to get um, a child out is occasional kind of disagreement between the parents, maybe either um, about the approach, but I think, and maybe this is what's under that, is more so um, real hurt that gets created because one of the parents is kind of taking it more seriously and thinks it's more of an issue, and then the other parent isn't, and so that, you know, just creates a lot of complications. Mm -hmm. 
when I work with a, a, a couple, let's say, or a family, but we'll say a, a couple, where one of them um, wants to uh, be more aggressive in terms of uh, uh, trying to get their loved one to see somebody who can put the cult experience in perspective. And the other one says, no, let's wait. Let's see. Let's see what happens. Um, I respect both of those positions. I say that there's two kinds of errors that could be made. One is, is intervening too early when the person would have come out on their own. The second error is not intervening when the person wouldn't have come out on their own. Both of those lead to problems. If they intervene and the person needed it, then everyone agrees that was good. If they don't intervene, the person didn't meet, need it, everyone agrees that that was good. So what I um, try to help the f- parents to do is to talk to each other about why they're taking the stance that they're taking. Um, I then try to help them to come up with some kind of plan that they can both agree to that says, we will hire somebody to speak to our son or daughter if this happens, if they ask for their passport, if they uh, want to leave the country, if they've been in for a year or six months or two years, I they they have to come up with the, the time. The the one that does not want to um, to intervene does not want to uh, have them speak to somebody. Um, I I say if if you're making a mistake, when will you know? And they can come up with a time. As I said, sometimes it's six months from now. Sometimes if he hasn't come out by Christmas, uh, it, I can't answer that question. But they, if they agree, if um, if he if he leaves school, it, it's different with every family. Yeah. Um, but if they can come up with some concrete uh, examples of the times that they would both agree, all right, we've waited long enough, um, uh, then we'll we'll do something. If one of them says, um, I want to give it a year, I'll turn to the other parent and say, can you live with that? Can you live with waiting a year? The other person might say, yes, okay. Or the other person might say, no, I can't wait that long. So they'll negotiate back and forth. The important thing is that they've got a, a mutual problem and they work it out in a way that neither of them feels that they've been um, um, misunderstood or or that their needs haven't been taken into consideration, that both of them agree, we now have a plan that both of us agree to, and we'll see what happens here. I can live with waiting for six months. If you agree that he's not out in six months, we've got to do something about it. Then, then that strengthens the family. Um, rather than uh, having them torn apart by this. Don't forget this situation, my my child or my parent or my sibling or, or whatever is in a cult, is not the kind of situation that um, most people have to deal with. And there isn't a script for it yeah. uh, as there is with some other kinds of problems, a mentally ill child or a, a child that, that uses drugs. There's more of a script. I'm not saying that those are easy situations right. either, um, but this is a situation where um, there's there's no no one knows what's right or wrong in terms of intervening. So the important thing is that the, both parents be on the same wavelength and both parents be a part of the solution that they come up with. Yeah, yeah. Amazing. And I I also find it fascinating, you know, as you're talking and I'm sort of envisioning the different family situations. um, Also, just how interesting it is, the more and more I get to learn about the kind of exit counseling process, um, how intricate and involved it is and how how you all really also create a team around it, you know, where you might pull in an ex member of the group or, you know, it's really lovely this way. 
We, sh we should mention, Jennifer, that neither Lorna nor I are exit counselors. We are psychotherapists. Exit counselors are usually former cult members themselves who have had a lot of experience talking to people and helping them to recognize it's a reality-inducing intervention where they might show videos, they might, as you said, bring former cult members in to talk to the, the individual, um, but that's not something that we do. We, we work with families that have people involved in the cult and helping them to strategize how to get them to see an exit counselor. And we work in group or individually with individual, individuals after they've left the cult. Ah, we're not, okay. we're not ex exit counselors. We don't talk people out of cults. It's not our expertise. It's not our, our way of, of working. Yeah. Yeah. No, thank you for that clarification. That's very helpful. Amazing, amazing work. And I know that anybody who comes across the two of you is very lucky. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, thank Jennifer. Thank you, Jennifer. Thank you so much for this time. I, I really appreciate it. I'm wondering before we wrap up if there's anything else that, that either one of you would like to say or share. Well, the only thing I can I, I, I'd like to, to say is when somebody leaves a cult, it's often a, 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 a tremendous blow to their um, uh, sense of trust. Uh, because they trusted individuals and the, the most correct decision they made in their life turned out to be a tragic error. And it's important to help them to recognize that 999 times out of a thousand in the past, their instincts were right. In this very important situation, their instincts were wrong because the, the, the group um, manipulated them and and uh, and often was not uh, uh, honest with them. So um, to help them not to blame themselves, oh. to help them to recognize that they can trust others again, that they were temporarily deviated from their their whatever their path in life is, and now they're back on the path. They're they're not going to de define as their most important status being an ex-cult member. Yeah. Um, uh, the many, what's, what's wonderful that's going on now, and you're an example of that, is former cult members who are mental health professionals who are helping people to move out and who, who better to understand what's going on with someone than someone who's been through it themselves. So this is a, a, um, a an example of of someone who was through a bad experience, who um, it, you know, presumably had something of a struggle to come out, and now are using that information to help others and to go on with your career and with your life, and that's a good positive outcome. Yeah, yeah, it has been. Honestly, it's not where I thought I would end up and everything just kind of fell into this uh, river called uh, the cultiverse. <laughs> and I somehow am on the boat traveling it. <laughs> so, well, thank you both very much. I think I'd love to end, Bill, if you don't mind my um, reading something that you wrote. I loved this uh line where you said, um, and this is from uh, cult recovery for clinicians, um, you said, finally, I tell the family that the most important single factor in helping them lead the cult member to reconsider the group is that of a loving and concerned communication. And that communication is the most important tool they have. Right. Well, thank you both again. Thank you, thank Jennifer. Thank you, Jennifer. It's really been a pleasure. We so hope that you enjoyed this episode and please stay tuned for part of Leaving the Cult, the season two song written by Jaya Suri. And for all things related to Jaya, her music, ways that you can support her, check out the show notes.